Welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're looking at some additional issues that I've seen brought up in various comments, replies, and requests, but which I haven't already done videos on. Last time, we talked about who made us subject to futility, and this time, what's the problem with Lutheranism? Now, it might not surprise you that as a Catholic, I don't agree with all of the beliefs associated with Lutheranism. Don't get me wrong, there's definitely some overlap, but there's also a number of Lutheran beliefs that I just don't think are true. I won't be addressing all of them in this video, just a few of the ones I haven't talked about yet. There are two big Lutheran beliefs, shared by many other Protestants as well, that are actually quite closely connected. The idea of a church with no centralized governance, and the idea of each person having individual access to God. Martin Luther himself would have called this a general priesthood, though today it's more commonly talked about as the priesthood of all believers. The reason that I say these two beliefs are connected is that each represents an effort to distance oneself from any need for a church hierarchy as such, and they share the common thread of seeking to break down barriers within the church between one group of people and another, so that as many people as possible share the same roles in the functions of the church. While I do think that individual people can learn certain things about God through their own efforts and researching the faith on their own time, I take issue with seeking to make all believers essentially equal to each other in church-based roles. Many people today value equality over anything else, but I just have to disagree with them in religious matters, and it's not because I have some personal issue with people being equal. It's because when I read through the Bible, I see no indication that God treats people this way, trying to make them equal to one another. In fact, God's overall pattern has been to appoint one, or a couple, or a few individuals who would have authority over others, either governing authority or teaching authority, or both. And things tended to go badly for people who didn't get with that program. God appointed Noah and his family to save mankind, and a lot of animals too. He chose Joseph to rescue the people of Egypt and the surrounding lands, including his own family, from a famine. He chose Moses and Aaron to lead the people out of Egypt and through the desert, and Joshua to lead them into the Promised Land. He chose the judges like Gideon and Samson to save his people from their enemies, David to kill Goliath and become the new king, and the prophets to call people to repent. When the Israelites finally did, he chose Cyrus to rescue them from Babylon and return them home, and in the New Testament, he chose Peter and the apostles, including Paul, chosen later, to spread the good news of his death and resurrection and the promise of eternal life. So, is it so hard to accept that not everyone is chosen? I don't think anything proves this quite as well as Numbers 16, in which Korah and his followers try to claim the priestly role for themselves, and in response, the earth swallows them up. So I think there's plenty of good reasons to suppose that some people are given special roles by God, like being able to administer the sacraments and offer special blessings to people, and that others just aren't intended to have those same roles. Another of Martin Luther's positions was that the Eucharist wasn't actually changed into Jesus' body and blood, but instead that it became both bread and the body of Jesus. My issue with this is that I don't see a need for it. Even in Martin Luther's time, they had the principle of Occam's razor, don't multiply entities, or in this case natures, beyond what's necessary to explain the facts. Jesus didn't say, this is both bread and my body, when he held up the Eucharist at the Last Supper. And it doesn't seem like being both bread and Jesus would do anything to explain why it still looks or smells like bread, at least nothing the Catholic explanation doesn't cover. It just seems like it proposes an extravagance that isn't needed to cover the facts. Martin Luther also rejected the existence of purgatory, but that's connected to the way he viewed justification, so I may as well address those two issues together. His view was that there were two components of being saved, faith and the grace of God. He believed that good works weren't required or beneficial at all. The problem is, despite all the books he removed from his version of the Bible, Martin Luther didn't remove the epistle of St. James, where it says, But some man will say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Shew me thy faith without works, and I will shew thee by works my faith. Thou believest that there is one God, thou dost well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? James 2, 18 
James is clearly criticizing this very position and saying that yes, works are needed, just faith isn't enough. In addition, Luther's understanding of justification was that people aren't really purified by God, they just have their sins covered over. Not only that, but he believed that people were completely incapable of turning to God through any effort of their own. This further explains his rejection of the concept of purgatory. If Luther didn't think people could be purified, then there would seem to be no purpose to a temporary afterlife to purify people before heaven. This is why I think that all of these views are connected. However, I don't think any of them are biblical. Which is easier to say, thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say to thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. Luke 5, 23-24 Jesus can forgive people's sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. James 1, 9 People can be purified by Jesus. For it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to accomplish, according to his good will. Philippians 2, 13 God gives us the ability to both will good things and to do good things. So, these are the problems with Lutheranism, and I just don't see any way to reconcile the Lutheran position with the plain words of the Bible, or with the rest of the church tradition. Next, what's the problem with Calvinism? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.